Due to the graphic nature of this program, viewer discretion is advised. One of the craziest, sadistic, depraved men on the planet, Mikhail Viktorovich Popkov, was born in Irkutsk, Russia, in 1964. At present, he has been convicted of 78 murders, although he has confessed to more. His reign of terror over the Angarsk region lasted approximately eight years, as he started in 1992 and continued until 2000. It is said what actually stopped him was when he contracted syphilis and became impotent. It extinguished his desire to rape and kill. Despite this, his arrest did not occur until 2012. One of the standout details from his cases is how he enjoys the act of killing. Some of his victims had over 150 stab wounds. They were frenzied attacks. The state he would leave the corpse in is what resulted in him being given the moniker, the werewolf of Siberia. His method of selection was to ask the victim if they wanted a lift in his police car. If they then agreed to share a drink with him, he had already sentenced them to death as he believed they were immoral. He would then drive them to a remote location, sexually assault and kill them, sometimes not in that order. Due to the trust of his position, most would accept this offer as a helpful, friendly policeman taking them home. He would even remind them that there was a rapist on the loose and that he would ensure they were safe. He would dump bodies on roadsides and near woodlands across the city, and very often return to the scene of the crime as a police officer. There has been speculation that he would target women who resembled his mother, who allegedly abused Mikhail during his childhood. I would doubt this claim due to the sheer number of victims. It is not feasible that 80 plus women would look like his mother, although it may well be what sparked his spree in the first place. Also, a large percentage of his victims were under 30. He claims that his first victim was a spontaneous act. He was giving a woman a lift and felt an overwhelming urge to harm her. One of his victims was a teacher at his daughter Catch's school. He said he wanted to cleanse the streets of prostitutes. He once returned to the crime scene of the murder of two women, 35-year-old Maria Lysina and 37-year-old Lilia Pashkovskaya because he had realised he had lost his police ID badge, which would expose him for what he is. When he got back, he saw the badge immediately, but also noticed one of his victims was still clutching onto life and breathing. He finished her off with a shovel. His wife, Elena, also worked for the police. While it is not suspected that she was in any way an accomplice, she did on more than one occasion provide police with a false alibi for her husband. They also had a daughter, Ekaterina, who believed him to be their perfect father. In interviews with his family, his wife, daughter, mother and sister still protest his innocence. Even after his confessions and irrefutable DNA evidence, Elena said during a Russian TV interview in 2015, We've been married for 28 years. If I suspected something is wrong, of course I would divorce him. I love him, I support him, I believe him. If he were to be released right now, I would not say a word and we would continue to live together. He did not cause any harm to me for all these years. I felt safe with him. She states that when she was allowed to see him ahead of his sentencing, he denied everything to her and his daughter. When asked if he had committed the murders by Ekaterina, Popkov said, Katya, you understand that these are fairy tales. It is the system. I have worked within it. I know the system well. Many people will question how his family can be so naive, especially with Elena being a former policewoman herself. Some may even question their sanity. For me, it is not surprising. We see it all the time with family members of those accused of the most unspeakable crimes. Yes, there is a blindness and delusion to some extent, but it is not deceptive. It comes from a place of love. Of course, the false alibi is an elusive one, but not patently malicious. I think many of us, without even thinking, have covered for people before. I remember as a young teen going on a camping trip to the seaside. There were six of us, and we met five Welsh girls. All of my mates were single at the time, and I was happily smitten with my first love. So I concocted a plan to mimic the voices of all six of us in a tent while the rest snuck out to meet the fillies. Of course, in the years that passed, the parents of my friend who we actually all went away with 
clocked what I was doing after about 30 seconds and were absolutely pissing themselves in their caravan. A somewhat strange analogy to use for this, but you get my point. Mikhail Popkov is pure evil, but that doesn't mean his loved ones are too. We of course immediately think of the victims and their close circles. It is only natural to, and rightly so. However, we tend to forget the family of the murderer. They too have faced tragedy by the actions of the person concerned. Their lives have now changed forever as well. They will have to question the period or whole lifetime they've spent with this individual. I think that last point is a huge part of why denial seems to be the route taken by many. They don't want to believe that this person they trust, love, admire, respect could be capable of such grotesque and barbaric behaviour because it invalidates so much. We all know how complex love is, especially the unconditional kind, with our own blood. So when you really think about it, it is no shock when families stand by their kin, or when they campaign for their innocence, when the rest of us know they are guilty as sin. Until I started preparing this, I had never really considered the effects on the criminal's relatives. It is just not something we do. I have watched a million murder documentaries and I'm guilty myself of immediately judging and vilifying them, thinking they are insane for not disowning the sick bastard. I'm sure you've done it too, but when you strip it back bare and look at it objectively, they never asked for or wanted this to happen either. They have arguably been deceived more than anyone. A harrowing account from a surviving victim, Svetlana Misaevictus who was a 17-year-old virgin at the time of the attack in 1998, explains how she was returning home from a friend's house. A policeman stopped and offered her a lift. She was cold and wrongly presumed she was safe to do so. Her ordeal saw Mikhail smash her head repeatedly into a tree. She also recalled how he never spoke during the attack. She managed to wriggle free and run away. She found some passers-by. Shockingly, they refused to help the young Svetlana and Mikhail caught up with her. She was attacked again and left for dead, naked in the snow. Half of her hair was ripped out during Popkov's depravity. It also resulted in her being paralysed down one side of her body. The next memory she has was waking up in the morgue, first spotting the toe tag on the corpse that lay beside her. After hospitalisation, she was discharged a few months later. The young girl had visibly gone through such a terrible experience that it had turned the teen's hair grey. It destroyed her life and now at 37 with no children, she looks back at what could have been if she had never got in that police car on that fateful night. She had described to investigators that the attacker was one of their own. She even identified his picture. Yet police ignored this due to the false alibi given by Mikhail's wife. Due to them disregarding Svetlana's testimony, he was free to take more lives for a further two years. If it was not for impotency, it is beyond comprehension what the final death toll would have been. The other glaring evidence they failed to follow up on was that one of his victims had syphilis and they were also aware that Popkov had contracted the disease. Clearly they did not want to believe this was a fellow law enforcement officer that was responsible for such heinous crimes. Former colleagues and friends have commented that he appeared as an extremely normal everyday man. They would have never guessed in a million years the truth about the other side of Popkov. He has been described as an organised maniac due to his ability to lead a public life of normality whilst turning into a beast away from the knowledge of the people around him, hence the werewolf nickname. Ironically, whilst on duty, Popkov had shot a rapist during an arrest. He was cleared of any wrongdoing and his actions were found to be justifiable. His arrest finally came as a result of DNA testing of 3,500 current and former policemen from the vicinity of Irkutsk. He must have known the game was up once he supplied his sample. He is slowly giving more and more confessions, the resulting convictions after proof is obtained. This keeps increasing his death count. Lieutenant Colonel Evgeny Karchevsky, the lead state investigator, believe the real number could be in the region of 100 to 200. In conclusion, this is the result of a psychopath getting into a position of authority or power. He totally abused his badge and the trust that came with it. He without doubt could not have claimed so many lives without the cover of his job. His claim that he was ridding the streets of immoral women shows his sanctimony 
and self-righteousness. He felt he had some God-given right to choose who lived and who died. Also, like many mentally unstable killers, he was extremely contradictory in his actions. It is hardly morally sound to savagely kill and rape many young women. His attacks were frenzied. He savoured every second of it and it was clearly part of a sexual build-up before the rape would take place, whether the victim was still alive or not. At least one of his victims was decapitated, another victim had her heart ripped out. Shockingly, medical experts deemed him sane, but concluded the motive for the killings was homicidal mania and an irresistible urge to kill. For me personally, I have to wonder if enough is done in the way of psych evaluation on people with authoritative positions or those in power. If implemented, it would certainly mean instant unemployment for many serving politicians. The werewolf will never see the light of day again, and rightly so. He is way beyond rehabilitation. If indeed you believe any serial killer, let alone one this prolific, is able to reform through any manner of therapy. Even if they try and go in, keep my head up high, now we flow there. I won't go, no, I won't fall. Oh. Right until I die, it's the only, only thing I know I ain't going. Heart so cold.